about China, and I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, kind of talking broadly about the microfinance movement in China, and then uh, spend most of the time talking about a, a specific study evaluating the impact of a village microfinance program uh, organized by the Chinese government in, uh, in villages in rural China. Uh, so uh, China, like uh, many other developing countries, still has a financial system which uh, is regulated and dominated by state-owned banks. And uh, this creates a system of credit rationing where there are a lot of people who would like to get low interest loans uh, but uh, cannot. And so there's, uh, for many years, been a concern in China that rural households in particular often find it difficult to gain access to credit, partly uh, because the size of their, the loans that they want to demand is, is very small and considered very inefficient from the standpoint of many banks when we're in a country in China where there's so many firms and so much industrial activity uh, that it's kind of a neglected uh, sector. There is, of course, uh, financial institutions that do uh, service rural areas, and the dominant institution in China is uh, the rural credit cooperatives, which are not really cooperatives. They're really still state-owned or state-organized uh, entities that are uh, governed by local agricultural banks, uh, which is a state bank in different areas. But they reach down to the township level, and uh, that's the closest place that many rural people can uh, make deposits and get loans. Uh, so I've been working on microfinance, uh, well I worked on microfinance a lot in the past, I haven't in some time, and so this is actually a, a new project that brings me back to the microfinance world. And I wrote an article uh, published about a decade ago about microfinance with uh, Chinese characteristics, and it uh, described the initial evolution of microfinance. Uh, this was a movement that uh, was popularized by the Grameen Bank, by Muhammad Yunus, especially in the 1990s. And in China, all of the development organizations in the mid to late 90s were very eager to establish microfinance uh, programs. Uh, these were mainly led uh, by organizations that wanted to alleviate poverty. So they were very targeted, the interest rates were low, and they generally followed the Grameen model of group lending. You find five borrowers, you're jointly liable for repayment, you pay, repay every week. Uh, etc. Now the government also got involved in the microfinance movement uh, in the early 2000s and started a very large-scale microfinance program also not, not by the banks but by the Poverty Alleviation Office as a poverty reduction model and they did these uh, with uh, state-provided subsidized credit targeted to poor households and they did it in many many in thousands of villages in China we did an initial evaluation way back then and found that the non-governmental programs performed pretty well, high rates of repayment, some evidence of impacts on income of rural households, and actually even if you evaluated the operating costs, they were done at fairly cheaply uh, because the cost of staff and space and administration at that time was still very relatively low in China. But the government programs performed very poorly, they were badly targeted. Uh, and uh, they had low repayment rates, partly because they were scaled up kind of in a blind fashion without much attention to making sure the model was being implemented true to its kind of founding principles. Uh, so that fad then passed. So, you know, like you know, international development uh, community often goes through these fashionable population models. And uh, I think actually, you know, a decade later, there are still some microfinance programs operating in China, but there's not a lot of energy or initiative to expand them to large scale. Um, what has happened more recently, I want to talk about is uh, kind of two initiatives. One is the government passed, uh, well, they started a pilot program in 2005 uh, where the Bank of China allowed in five provinces microfinance companies to be registered uh, and it's very similar to the Russian types of uh, companies I think. Uh, you couldn't take deposits but if you had equity and you wanted to lend for profit uh, you could do so in these approved areas and uh, you could have a lot of flexibility in terms of the types of loans, the people you lent to, and the interest rates as well. So you could 
try to see if you could get people to borrow at a for-profit model with very relatively lax uh, regulation by the Bank of China because they felt, you know, as long as they're not taking deposits, you know, if you want to risk your own capital and you lose it, we're not going to worry about it. And if you can make money, go ahead. And that actually uh, was uh, recently expanded to the whole country uh, and has generated a lot of activity uh, of people, like in Russia, I think, trying to make money from microfinance, mostly for profit, but also some of the big international microfinance organizations like Axion, Finca, have also come into China. Uh, we had an event last year with this uh, guy from Global Planet Finance, uh, Microcred, which is a French microfinance organization that has operations in many countries, and they're also uh, expanding fast in China. Um, so there's very little study of that, actually. I've been kind of interested to see how this was affecting the broader uh, rural financial markets or financial markets more generally, um, but it's been hard to get systematic data. Uh, another new development in microfinance uh, in China has been uh, the development of, uh, or an initiative by, again, the official government poverty alleviation office to start a village banking intervention in many poor villages. So this is a much smaller scale, I think. And uh, this is actually the program we're going to talk about. So uh, uh, I'm actually not sure how much it has been sc scaled up and how many villages have the program in China. Uh, but my colleague, Wang Sangui, and I should say that this is joint work with a PhD student of mine, Xu Tsai, uh, who has really uh, taken the main lead in analyzing this data, and Sangwei Wang, who's a professor at Renmin University of China. And Sangwei is a very well-known poverty expert in China and often consulted by the Chinese government on poverty programs. And he, was, uh, he worked with the government to do a randomized control trial intervention where they piloted this uh, village banking intervention in a randomized fashion, uh, which I'll describe in a minute. And so, uh, obviously, that enables us to do much more convincing evaluation. And so, this is very, this is the first time we've presented uh, these results. So it's a very new uh, paper. Okay, so this is just a quote I found online uh, that describes the current landscape of microfinance in China. Uh, so, China also is a relatively newcomer, but uh, there are now something like 6,000 microcredit providers. Um, many of them um, are relatively young. This is this recent explosion, you know, I think related to the microfinance law. And uh, the year uh, soon after they started the microfinance company kind of uh, pilot program, the People's Bank of China announced that they were endorsing kind of the establishment of uh, rural cooperative banks and village banks, village and township banks, as well as these microcredit companies. Um, and so uh, there's now a, a more open space for innovation in this sector. And Alibaba, as many of you know, is now also getting, uh, is aggressively trying to enter the uh, loan space, probably more on the consumer credit side through its Ali Finance arm. Okay. All right. So. Um, before getting into the, ch the results of our kind of impact evaluation study, uh, just want to say a couple words about the recent academic literature that has tried to evaluate microfinance interventions in other countries. Uh, the Grameen model has been widely questioned about whether a group lending is an important aspect of success in microfinance, but it has obviously been, uh, and still is, I think, viewed as a, a great uh, success model for uh, reaching the poor and influencing uh, poverty. There have been a lot of mixed results uh, on how much increasing credit access through these microfinance interventions actually improves the incomes of rural households. Uh, and so we had a, uh, a well-known expert in this area give a talk in the economics department uh, last week, and uh, he seemed to convey that there's a growing sentiment that the evidence of impacts is actually very weak, that uh, there's studies that have found no impact of randomized controlled trial microfinance programs on income gains. Um, in particular, a study by Banerjee and others has, has been uh, received a lot of attention uh, where they argue that at the margin, 
the microfinance loans may kind of shift the economic activity of some households in noticeable ways, but if you just add up the income, it doesn't actually have a big effect. Um, so that raises into question. It could be, of course, that existing sources of credit supply are meeting the demands for good projects sufficiently, you know, the informal credit or the banking system. So the question is whether there is really is this window for microfinance to offer something that the market, the current market is not uh, meeting. And of course, this could vary quite a bit in different institutional contexts. So that's kind of the background. It's now a very contested issue. <laughs> Do microfinance programs really work in terms of affecting uh, income growth and influencing economic growth? All right, so we're gonna look at uh, this uh, randomized control trial intervention, which is a village banking program. It's a model that is being promoted by uh, China's official government uh, poverty alleviation office. And uh, just as a preview, we're going to find actually in our study that there are fairly substantial gains to income in, uh, in rural China. And most of the loans uh, that are being taken in this program are for agriculture. So for cropping, livestock, uh, rural activities. Although, of course, money is always fungible. So uh, we'll, we'll look at a bunch of impacts to see uh, what's really changing in the behavior of the households. And we're going to argue that uh, one reason why we may be seeing bigger income impacts in China than in other places is related to the development of factor markets that um, not only is there a credit access issue in rural China as, as in many places, uh, there's also issues related to the uh, mobility of labor in the labor market. And this provides more space for a, for a loan to actually uh, increase the profitability of household activity. And I'll be more specific about the explanation uh, at the end. Um, and so, so at least we're contributing uh, and providing a fairly strong contribution to literature saying, hey, at least in, in, in certain contexts, in, in China in particular, uh, these interventions can really matter and lift uh, uh, households out of poverty. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, as background, the Village Fund program, some of its features, and a little bit about our experimental design and about the actual uh, characteristics of the loans that are taken by the households under this program. And then I'll go right into just basically the findings of the impact evaluation. Okay. Uh, so the program, uh, basically the government uses its own funds to capitalize a village bank. So it just gives a a chunk of money <laughs> to the village and says, okay, we're going to give you this fund. And the average was about 176,000 renminbi. So it's not a whole lot of money. Um, and uh, most of it is from the central government and some is from participation fees. You can think of this as a membership fee to be part of the group that is going to gain access to the loans. Um, and it's supervised by the county government poverty alleviation office. Uh, but it's managed by a self-elected Kind of committee that runs the fund. Okay, there's no restriction on participation, and uh, there is a expressed kind of desire that an effort should be made to include the poor. So poor are exempted from paying a membership fee, um, but it isn't very strictly enforced. And it's mainly there is also kind of an expectation that the loans will be used for income generating activities and not uh, for consumption. Okay. So uh, the experiment was done in five different provinces where two counties were chosen in each province and in each county, three treatment villages and two control villages. Um, and then a survey was conducted, a baseline survey just before the program started and then two years after or about a year and a half after maybe. Uh, so in each uh, uh, village we sampled 30 households a uh, total sample of 1,500 households in 50 villages in the 10 counties. Okay, and there was an attrition rate in the follow-up survey of about 10%. Okay, so this is where the provinces and counties uh, are located involved in the study. Um, the loans were uh, followed a Grameen model in terms of joint liability. So people had to form groups of five to seven households and then uh, members of that group would get the loan in sequence. Um, but there was no weekly repayment. 
So that part of the model was not uh, followed, the Grameen model. Um, so the average loan size was about 4,000 uh, renminbi. So that's about, uh, what is that, $60, so $70. Um, and it's an, typically an annual loan. Is that right? Yeah, okay, right. Um, <laughs> and the interest rate, so uh, the groups were able to set their own interest rate, and they tended to pick low rates, uh, even lower than the rural credit cooperatives. Um, and it's not clear why they decided to do that, uh, maybe because they were all, uh, they could all capture some of the rents that way. And of course, if they get successful repayment, then the money will grow with the interest, and then they keep they can, they can keep lending in principle this money forever and increase loan sizes as the fund grows in size. So they do have an incentive, I think, to make sure loans are repaid. Otherwise, the capital disappears and the program <laughs> ends, and no more loans, right? Um, and so there's no collateral requirement, but typically there were uh, guarantors, in particular the other group members. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to kind of jump through the methodology. I mean, we do a pretty standard, uh, our main estimate is just an intention to treat effect. So uh, we kind of verify that the randomization was in fact pretty random across villages. And then we just look at how does the income, how does income differ in the treated villages compared to the other villages where we can maybe control for some, some things in a regression setup. But it's basically just uh, uh, relying on the assumptions uh, uh, for the randomization. Uh, in addition to just doing an average effect of, you know, how do households in treated villages fare compared to those in non-treated villages, we also try to separately get a sense of the magnitude of the effects on um, the participating households. So, so even in a village that has the program, some households will participate and some will not. And we're kind of interested in understanding, obviously, how the households who participated are affected, since they're the ones who <laughs> see the biggest benefits. But because when you put when you inject a lot of capital into an, into a village, it's possible that there could be a spillover effects to other households. So if some households are now getting a lot more money and more income, they could be lending more to other households, and you could actually see benefits accruing to other households as well. So we wanted to get a sense of those spillovers. Uh, and the effect on participants. Uh, and so we try to separate kind of the impacts among participants and non-participants. But the problem is in the control villages, we can't really divide people into participants and non-participants, right? Uh, we, can, we could maybe do that in the future if the control villages start to lend, start the program, then we can see you know, who starts to borrow and lend. But uh, at this point, we don't have that. So what we do is we use a matching estimator approach where we take the people who actually participated in the treated villages, we just kind of run a regression to see what types of households actually take up the loans in the treated villages. And we use those characteristics to predict in the control villages uh, what kind of house similar, uh, identify houses that look very similar to the ones who were taking the loans and do that kind of comparison. We can do that separately for the participating households and the non-participating households. So it gives us some insight, but it relies on this assumption that we can capture participation by the observable characteristics. And so is subject to certain types of biases and doesn't really exploit the power of the randomization the same as the kind of total effect on the, all of the households in the village does. Okay, so that should be kept in mind. So this is just math to basically say what I said, that we have to make some assumptions and we do this kind of uh, methodology using a matching estimate to look at it. And then we, of course, one of the advantages is we can do everything in difference in difference. So we're looking not just at the income differences in cross-section, but how incomes have changed in the treated villages compared to the change in the control villages. Okay, so let's just, okay, so uh, then to check uh, for possible source of bias, we first test the assumption of the randomization to see whether the characteristics, the village and household characteristics are similar in the treatment villages and in the control villages, and we verify that uh, they are very similar. There's no real uh, significant differences across this battery of characteristics that we have data on. And we also, because we have some attrition in the sample, we want to do some tests to see whether attrition is also related or not to treatment, being a treatment village or control village, we could, which could introduce bias, but we find that there's no evidence of that. Okay, so 
then we can go right forward, go right to the estimates. Um, <clears throat> so uh, to give you a picture of what the borrowing behavior was like before the program, this table just shows uh, that about 59% of households uh, in the sample were borrowing some kind of loan before the program started. Um, and of those, 22% uh, had a production loan, 47% had a consumption loan. So consumption borrowing is much more popular than uh, borrowing for production purposes. Uh, of the uh, borrowing that existed before the program, almost all of it was uh, informal borrowing at no interest rate, so just borrowing from friends and relatives. So of the 59% of, of households borrowing, 51% were borrowing informal loans, and uh, th only 13% were borrowing from formal sources, mainly this rural credit cooperative or other banks. And uh, an even smaller, very small, uh, share were borrowing informally at some positive interest rate. Okay. Um, and interesting, the, the formal loans were split also between production and consumption loans. Okay. Now, when we um, introduced the program, let me actually jump to this, the impact on the borrowing of the program. So, uh, uh, the labels are not clear, I apologize for that. So AT is just the total effect, the intent to treat effect on treatment villages. Then AT, P are the participants and then the non-participants using this matching methodology. And you can see that uh, for all of the households in treatment villages, uh, the likelihood of borrowing something increased by 15%. Uh, and um, the likelihood of borrowing from a village bank increased by 23%. Uh, roughly speaking, about 30% of the households that we surveyed in the treatment villages took up the loan. So that's a pretty high take-up rate compared to evidence from other interventions in other uh, countries for which studies have been done. Um, and you can see that all of this effect, as we would expect it the, on the participants, so there is a very large uh, likelihood among the participants of having the, uh, the village bank loan. That's by definition, really. And of increasing uh, the probability of having any loan by 56%. Okay. And then, let me see what's next. Okay, so then uh, the one thing I want to do before getting to the other results, uh, so then we're going to look at the impacts. So this is just to say that uh, our program is actually increasing the credit borrowed by households. It's not being, it's not crowding out, it's not being substituted for, it's not just substituting for loans that previously were being borrowed from other sources. It's really creating new, new credit availability. Um, and before getting into the detailed impacts on income and components of income, I wanted to also uh, point out that uh, migration in this area is really important in all of China, really. I mean, China is a huge internal migration country, but especially in poorer villages. And these are all poor villages because they're villages targeted by the Poverty Aviation Office. So one thing we want to look at is wage income of people uh, living in these villages. And this is just to document some of the wage differences if you migrate out, okay? So the way to read this is that uh, you could have a, you could be earning a wage uh, in your own village, or you can migrate to these four different types of destinations which are increasingly distant. You could migrate to another village in the same town, you could uh, migrate to another township in the same county or to the county seat, you could migrate out of the county but within the province, or you could out, uh, migrate outside of the province, which is the, still the biggest form of migration in China because you have this huge movement of people from interior parts of China to coastal parts of China. And as you go out, the wages increase. So uh, just take the left-hand side. What 224 is saying is that your monthly wage, if you move from working within the village to working in the town, in another village or in the township seat, then your wage will increase by 224. And if you go outside the province, it'll increase by 520 uh, renminbi per month. Um, these days, a typical wage in China uh, for a migrant worker is probably going to be 2,000 2, to 3,000 RMB. So 
500 is a pretty big uh, share of that, and especially for men, but all people moving out of the province. The farther you go, the better way you can get. There's more opportunities, usually in larger urban areas. Okay, that's important because obviously uh, one suspicion I had in doing this evaluation was that you know in China everyone now migrates for jobs and they're pretty good jobs at pretty good pay now. So maybe microfinance doesn't really matter, right? Because people are getting a pretty good return on their labor. And so why do we want to fund like rural activity in poor villages uh, or agricultural activity in poor villages? Uh, so I was kind of, I kind of thinking maybe we wouldn't get a huge result. And the, we kind of feel like the labor market is pretty well developed in China. I've made that point many times in talking to people about the labor market in China. Okay, so we'll see what happens. Uh, it turns out that uh, if we look at the effect on um, inputs into agriculture, whether it be the amount of sown area to cropping, especially for cash crops, uh, or in terms of inputs, you can see for participating households, uh, we're seeing uh, more sown area overall, and especially to, it's all going to cash crops, and we're seeing more inputs uh, into agriculture. So the money is actually being used for agriculture by the participants. Um, and when we look at animal husbandry, we also see evidence that the money is increasing uh, the investments in terms of the inputs and the total expenditure on these uh, kind of agricultural business activities. Okay, and then, uh, um, then when we look at the profits, which really uh, feed into income, we find that for the uh, for households in the treatment villages, uh, profits from farming, from crop farming, do increase significantly by over a thousand. So this is a, a household level uh, a difference. Um, and for uh, for the ones that are participating, it's uh, nearly th uh, t it's two thousand four hundred. Uh, RMB in profit, um, and for uh, and I think that's probably something like ten percent or fifteen percent of income. Um, and there's evidence also of positive effects on uh, animal husbandry, although that's li a little bit less significant, but positive. Okay. And then what's interesting is we also found a positive effect on migration. So. Uh, it's a little bit kind of contradictory in a way because we're kind of saying, well, on the one hand, they're doing more in agriculture on the farm, but on the other hand, they're also uh, they're also sending more people out to migrate, right? And uh, so you can see for participants, the number of working days in uh, out migration wage earning activity increases by 55 uh, person days uh, per year. Uh, especially by men, but also by women, but not quite statistically significant. Um, and uh, and so, um, how do you reconcile kind of increases both in migration and off farm earnings? Well, it only makes sense if the labor market is kind of not working very well, and you need finance to. Uh, well, there's two models that we kind of have in mind for trying to understand that. One is that um, there's a, kind of a capital constraint to migration. In other words, that it actually costs something to migrate and people uh, have a lack of cash reserves and so part of the loan can actually be used to help finance people to go migrate and some of the loan can also be used to improve the productivity of agriculture at home because they're constrained on both margins. So if you're constrained on both margins and you get a loan infusion, you're going to expand across both margins and you'll get both positive effects. The other a story you can tell is that the increasing agricultural productivity uh, for a subsistence model of agriculture uh, by increasing productivity, households may be able to achieve kind of some target level of cropping income or self-produced grain to feed themselves with less labor and so it releases surplus labor to go off farm into the labor market and earn income. That's the idea that before we think about migrating we're definitely going to make sure we produce enough uh, food to feed ourselves, right? But not much more than that because it's not that profitable. And so, 
raising productivity in agriculture can actually release labor to take advantage of more profitable off-farm activity. So you could think of either of those models. Okay, and then um, within the home, so I mean the non-migrant uh, labor supply for wage employment is negative across the board, uh, but not as big as those positive effects, and so not, not statistically significant. Okay, and then finally, the bottom line thing is the, the total income across all activities, and then we'll also look at the consumption, which is kind of the preferred well-being measure for rural households. For income, you can see that the total income is increasing by uh, 6,000 is the intention treat effect and 15,000 is for the uh, participants, which is substantial. And there's even some, so there's some increase in the cropping income, there's some increase in the labor income from, presumably from migration and getting higher wage employment. Uh, but also we see an effect on the uh, business in income, the self-employed business income, which is non-farm uh, kind of activity it's a big effect, but it's uh, not a lot of households are doing that. So it's just a few households, but making substantially more. Okay. And finally, there's also an effect on measured uh, consumption on food and on durable consumption um, for the participating households. Okay. So the overall picture is, is quite positive. Uh, we find these uh, significant increases. And uh, Xu Tsai, the, my PhD student, ha has developed a second paper which is much more theoretically and empirically <laughs> elaborate uh, that tries to really delve more deeply into whether it can be explained by the story of simultaneous frictions in the credit and labor market. There, you know, this Banerjee Duflow paper that has been influential on no impacts, what they say happens is that in their households, uh, ag local agricultural and self-employment activity increases, but there is a negative effect on migration. So people are coming back home to put their labor supply into those activities, and so the net effect on income is actually very little or zero, not, statist not statistically significant. So here we find an opposite effect where we see the agricultural productivity growth, but we actually see an increase in migration, and it, it, it doesn't make sense unless there are additional frictions in the factor markets. Um, and we also find that this is especially true. All of these results, uh, in terms of the probability of lending, the effect on migration, are particularly true for the low asset households. So the ones that, in fact, are most likely to be constrained. Uh, so I actually find, found these results surprising. I just thought that uh, given the non-farm opportunities in China these days, where even in rural households, a, a, a big chunk of income is coming from, typically, from uh, migrant wage income. I just felt that the marginal benefit to incomes for rural households of a, of a credit program might be much more limited than in the past when China was uh, much more agricultural. But uh, the results are pretty uh, convincing that uh, there's still uh, room for this microfinance middle, like in the picture that you know, was just put up previously, there, there's the informal loans, there's the banks, and there's the space in the middle, and that this seems to be making a difference for rural households in China. So I'll stop there. Any questions? Yeah. I have a question. Right. Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for being on your analysis. Um, when I was, so, so it, might, it seems like uh, this whole problem is about giving money to people, like to communities. And when I think about will it be working in Russia, the answer, in this way, the answer is no. Because you cannot just give money. You need to educate, to provide some infrastructure, training, mentorship, etc. etc. So the question is, is it only about money or is there is a whole system which supports the process? So do you send any uh, mentors there who will help them to use the money properly? To buy crops the, pro the, project, the project doesn't. Yeah. The government has its own program. I mean, the government has a, uh, I mean, the government has programs in China for almost everything, and including uh, local governments are often trying to uh, 
support development projects and they will try to organize training or try to encourage farmers to grow new types of crops using new technologies and there so will be there always will be some of this kind of activity uh, people will differ on whether they think that what the government is pushing is usually you know necessarily in the best interest of households or it carries uh, inordinate risk or not um, but uh, there is that kind of but I my, my feeling here is that uh, a lot of the activity is not new technologies I mean there is a cash crop benefit here but probably it's mostly about the cash I mean because cash crops are much more input intensive than uh, grain crops and uh, yeah. What are the typical cash crops? Oh, uh, this is across five provinces, so it'll probably be different mm -hmm. uh, in different places. In, uh, but they're all kind of in poor uh, locales. So uh, I think typical cash crops might, might be like rapeseed oil, mm -hmm. uh, that a lot, at least a lot of in Western China, um, but in Part of these, uh, one of the problems is Sichuan. I don't know what other cash crops they grow in other places. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's a good question, though. Is there a pattern that men are more likely to migrate than women? Because they, that the figures you showed for the differences in wages when they grow out, uh, the females actually. One yeah, the effects are stronger and more significant for men than for women. There is some, there's a positive effect on female migration as well, but it's not significant. So, yeah, I think it's more men than women. And so then, uh, would the women be more likely to be taking on more agricultural work and then the men will migrate? So we don't see that. Uh, we don't see a a big labor supply effect on, on, on agricultural activity. So they're doing more profitable agriculture. It seems like they're moving into cash crops and maybe expanding animal husbandry, which takes less labor. But uh, it doesn't look like, at least not in a significant, <laughs> at least significant magnitude. Uh, we see both a positive effect from uh, on income and migration. So can we observe the uh, effect from migration on income? I mean, because we have some like uh, positive effect on migration of those neighbors from rural areas to urban areas. And then we also observe the income increase of there. Yes, so we do see increase in labor income here, right? In the red, the household labor income is increasing. Actually, substantially in this estimate for the participants in the program, um, okay, so even for the non-participants, but those not, it's not significant. So both in um, like migration, labor income, and both in uh, and uh, the like growing crops. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, so we should check that, but I think uh, I think it's I think many households are maybe doing are, are expanding on both margins. Yeah. What's your hypothesis about what's happening to the non-participating households because there was no increase in borrowing for them. But you are. Yeah, nothing seems to be very significant. There's some magnitudes that maybe are. Let me go back to the borrowing thing. Uh, actually, I thought we found. Let's see. Yeah, this is the borrowing any from any source. Actually. Uh, so there aren't a very, there's an effect on the propensity to borrow. Um, I think we found some evidence that if you look at the amount of, lend, of borrowing, so I don't have this figure, the amount of borrowing, um, well, no, I think what we found is the amount of borrowing is that for participants, it crowds out, of, there is this crowd out of informal loans, so they borrow less from friends and relatives. But for the non-participants, I guess we're not seeing much yet. Which is maybe surprising since the income increases seem pretty big, right? Yeah. So maybe they're not sharing their, found, their newfound wealth yet. I mean, it's also early in the program. Mm 
Sir, but do you think there's a difference because the government is involved in this microfinance program in the sense that, so on two counts, so first, uh, when people get these loans, they are less likely to use it for consumption purposes because they think the government is involved and they can sort of pull them up if they, do, if they don't do what they are committed to do. And second, is there local political competition? So when I, as, the, as a leader, as a political leader in a particular county, see you do this randomized treatment in my county, it's sort of a prestige issue that I want to sort of, you know, push this program to be successful. Maybe I'll get more loans in the future. Maybe the central government is going to monitor me and give me a promotion and so on. Right, those are very good questions. Um, yeah, so the biggest concern was somehow that, you know, they've, they know it's a pilot or something, and I don't think that's the way it was presented. You know that if you do a good job here, you'll uh, you'll get a lot more money. Um, uh, but we don't have direct data on the monitoring effort of uh, government officials. I think our sense, and I'm not as inv as involved in the direct intervention as as my colleague Sangwe was. So I should ask him if he has any uh, thoughts or evidence on this. But our sense is that you know these are still pretty remote villages, and so there's not a lot of uh, presence of the uh, government officials there. Um, but yeah, that's in that's in. I think, and not just the government officials, the involvement of of researchers in the project also is different, right? Than if you scaled up the program nationally, let's say, where maybe the maybe the researchers went in there and trained people better or did a better job you know, explaining the models than you know, will happen later. <laughs> or uh, there was a, or gave people a sense of greater monitoring intensity <laughs> so people didn't, didn't want to uh, you know, abuse the access to the uh, cash. So there's, yeah, so, I, so in that sense, probably you should characterize these as upper bound limits of the potential you know, for well-run uh, program. Yeah. Okay, we should go to the last presentation. Please.